Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. Um, I've called my message tonight, um, Easter's Breaking Bad, a response. Because um, I must have listened to the stuff that was said last Saturday, um, at least twice, and I've read it. If you're not aware, on the um, website, the, um, all that was said last week that Anth read out, it's actually available for you to read and reread on the website. Also, the newsletter that came out this week that... Jenny does a great job off every week. If you're not getting the newsletter, do get, let us have your email address because it's a really good summary each week of what's been said, plus other notices and things. And Francesca's blog is always concluded on there and they're just excellent, those of you who've read them. So if you weren't here last week or you've missed it, please listen and please read and have a look with what was said because we were breaking some myths. And mythology is a collection of myths or a study of myths. And we did some work around those last week and... I did the introduction, so I had a sense of the essence of where it was going. But I found, still I found myself last week um, really quite um, captivated with the journey we went on during the course of the night. And I've been playing it over and over in my mind. Um, and so I just wanted to respond to that tonight. So I've just started writing, saw where I got to, sharing some thoughts with you tonight about it, because I had to admit to myself during the week, as I've thought, that although I sat there last Saturday and thought, yes, great, to every word that was said, I also recognised that some of the symptoms of my life um, make clear to me that I am attached a little bit to some of those um, Myths, that there's a, they're in me somewhere, because even though rationally I can think, yes, I believe this, I react like some of that stuff is true in my life, and it has caused me some damage. And I don't use the term damage lightly. And, and I know I'm not alone here, because many of us have had to unlearn some stuff and relearn it. And if we're not ca careful... Um, our faith life as people, I know I've been in the church my whole life, it can actually become a form of slavery rather than the freedom for which Christ intended it. And some of you know what I mean by that. And some of you have not experienced that. And that's brilliant. And it's brilliant that we're a community where we can all learn and unlearn together from each other's experiences. Now, one of the things Ant said last week was he quoted Robert Capon. I don't know if that's how I say his name accurately. But he said, we will do almost anything to avoid putting our faith in a God who doesn't come up to our standards for divinity. And Joel alluded to it at the start when he said, we make God in our own image sometimes. And we do all have standards of how we think should be done. And we know that we have those standards because we really react when things are done in a way we think they don't they should not be done. And we know by how it happens and how we react that sometimes we have a standard for divinity too. We have a sense in which God should be doing X or people who serve God should be doing X. And even worse, arguably, is we stand and we say, I represent God and you should be doing X, when perhaps that's not the story and perhaps that's us imposing it. Now, I remembered the verse in 1 Corinthians 8 this week and I kept thinking about it lots and things kept confirming it to me that it was an issue sometimes in my life. And it's the verse that says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And some of you will be familiar with that verse. And the context, I'm not going to read the whole chapter tonight, but 1 Corinthians 8 is really well worth a read to look at the context in which that was said. Because I found it quite interesting that it shows how the things we talk about now were talked about then. Now, it was about food sacrifice to idols. So that's not a conversation that we tend to have on a weekly basis, but the principles around what should be happening in churches and what shouldn't, and how should we be dealing with these people over here who've got these beliefs, and these people over here who've got these beliefs, and should we be fitting in with them and being sensitive to that? All of those conversations have been happening 
since the birth of church right back in the beginning because all that stuff's got to be wrestled. Should we allow this? Shouldn't we? Is this helpful to everybody? Is this not helpful? Who do we have to cater for? How will other people feel about it? What's priority? We're still having those conversations and it would do all of us good to remember that asking questions about the application of kingdom living and the revelation that we have is, is a normal part of any kind of pioneering experience. And we're just doing our bit in 2016 in York to try and take the revelation we've been given and unfold it as we believe is right for us to do. Now, Paul had to make a call on some things as well. It was all debated and talked about, and should we, shouldn't we? He had to make a call on some things too, and I was, I was smiling to myself this week thinking, I bet everybody had an opinion on his decision that he made. Some people would have gone, yeah, right, great decision, Paul. Other people would go, oh, I don't think Paul's right about that. And that's part of it, isn't it? And it's okay, because actually God saw the world as good and not perfect, and we're all right to be learning and unlearning all the time. And what we've been hearing recently is that God shut the book on favour. He shut the book on favour, and we have to trust and move forward in his favour. Now, last week, the other, one of the other things that was said was that um, this is what's been established, a new, different, extraordinary covenant for humanity saturated with divine forgiveness and pardon through grace that is obscenely good, scandalously benevolent, and powerfully life-changing, driven by unconditional love. That's a lot of good stuff in there. That's huge. But it occurred to me, as I responded to Easter's Breaking Bad, that I thought that's actually quite a good way for me to... Um, measure whether, whether I'm experiencing that narrative or whether I'm attached to myth. So, does the revelation that I have about all we heard last week and about all that we hear every week, does it seem almost too good to be true in my life? Is that what I'm experiencing? Does the kindness seem to blow my socks off? Does it, is it kind to the point where I cannot believe this thing is this kind? Is it transforming my life um, and do I know that he absolutely loves me unconditionally and tonight as you sit there I just think that that sometimes we hear stuff and we can tell ourselves we think it and we have to have sometimes a measure to say is this at work in my life and there are areas where I can say sometimes I don't feel it's fully good news and in the areas I don't feel it's fully good news, it's because I'm until attached to some of that myth that I can somehow get separated, that somehow my badness is going to be a problem, that somehow he can be disappointed with me, that somehow or other God's subject to some higher law that means that at some point he's going to have to say, no, he's going to have to somehow. And rationally, I know that's not the truth, but I still live like it. So then you think, right, I've got to be prepared to say, okay, save me from my own historical knowledge and bring me to a new revelation. Now, there, if knowledge pu puffs up but love builds up, that actually implies to me that knowledge can be a problem. And as someone who is an educator, I think, oh, whoops, I spend my day job imparting knowledge what sort of problems knowledge do I need to get another job? No, but if you actually look at the knowledge and what it means, the original word, it means general intelligence, understanding, and then these are the four things that come out under knowledge. Number one, the general knowledge of Christian religion. Number two, the deeper, more perfect and enlarged knowledge of this religion, such as belongs to the more advanced. Number three, um, especially of things lawful and unlawful for Christians. Do we know the rules and how well do we know the rules? Um, number four is moral w wisdom, such as is seen in right living. So the knowledge that it talks about in that verse is all about how much we know about this Christian thing and the religion and how it works and the morals and the rights and wrongs and about what should and shouldn't be done. Now, it's said that the knowledge of that and its morals can really puff us up and make us feel quite substantial, which I thought was interesting what Joel said in his intro about um, 
us feeling powerful and wanting a power. It's that same kind of idea. There's a knowledge that we can have that can give us a sense of feeling substantial, but it talks about how that's actually us puffed up, and that meant to inflate, blow up, cause to swell up, to bear oneself loftily, to be proud. So what that knowledge can give us is a sense of being something, but it's not necessarily something that is really worth having. There's something better. Where our historic knowledge has given us something substantial, we hold on to it, because why, why wouldn't you? It occurred to me today that it's a bit like inviting someone to let the air out of your tires of the car that gets you everywhere you need to go in life and say, all right, okay, just come and let all the air out. Because that stuff we've known, that stuff I've known, has got me to places in my life. And why would I invite someone to just take all of that away? But Jesus talks about not putting new wine into old wineskins. So not only do we need new cars, tires on the car, we need a whole new car sometimes to drive somewhere better. Now, where it says love builds, the word love there is that agape love. It's affection, goodwill, love, benevolence, brotherly love. And then it's got this thing that says love feasts. I mean, that sounds like you're just going to binge on how loving everybody and everything is, doesn't it? So that kind of love, it says that kind of love is going to build. So it's not going to puff you up. It's not going to inflate you in a proud way. It's going to genuinely build something. And it suggests to me that there's an entirely new experience for us all still beyond whatever we've got to this point. Because actually, um, if we're saying that we know everything there is to know, we're a bit like that. There's that great verse isn't there in Ecclesiastes that says, there's nothing new under the sun. And we're actually saying there isn't anywhere to go or anything to move towards. Now, where it says to build, love builds. Build means to build a house, erect a building. That's fairly standard, build. Um, it also means to restore, to rebuild, to repair, to found or establish, to promote growth in Christian wisdom, affection, grace, virtue, holiness, blessedness, to grow in wisdom and piety. So that's what love's going to grow. And it's actually about not what do we know, what have we known, but actually how are we doing on our agape love bit? Because the love bit is going to build more than the knowledge of the rights and wrongs of how it works of the laws. It's going to build up more. Now, we have a saying at my work, we talk about um, applying wisdom to the data. Sounds bizarre. But in schools, you are absolutely overloaded with data. Every child has data, numbers and letters and things that follow them. And what we talk about at work is that you can have all those numbers and facts and figures, but what you're really looking to do as great leaders in schools is apply wisdom to that. So not just to have the numbers all laid out and in your spreadsheet, but to be able to look at it and understand what it actually means and where you should move forward. And I kept thinking about this today, thinking we can have so much information in our life. But if we don't have an understanding of that information, and if we're not able to apply a wisdom to that information, we know a lot. We have a lot to be proud of. We have that sense of being inflated, but without the wisdom and the love in how it's applied, it doesn't build anything. It's just information. Now, Jesus, again, knew the data. He knew the laws, the rules, the do's, the don'ts. But what he seems to have a knack of doing that we can look to him as the author and perfecter of our faith, remember, and it's worth looking at how he did it. He was able to apply wisdom attached to a deeper knowing of that agape love. So he, in times, threw the rules out the window. He just threw them out the window because he looked and he said, yes, I've got the information. I know what the rule is in this moment. I'm not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. I'm not supposed to feed these people. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to speak to them. But right now in this moment, yes, I know that that is 
the information up until this point in history, but that is not how grace and wisdom and love works in this moment now. So sack that and building something on love. And he could just throw it out the window. Now, I went to a wedding yesterday of two really lovely, lovely friends of mine, and they asked me to do a reading. And, and it was the reading you would expect to read at the wedding. Guess which one it was? <laughs> 1 Corinthians 13. And so my first thought was, I mean, I, I, I adore these people. So I was very proud and happy to do it for them. Um, but it was 1 Corinthians 13. I thought, oh yeah, I know that. So I went to the wedding rehearsal on Thursday night. It was this lovely, lovely little church in Haxby. Um, and it was a Catholic um, church done by a Catholic priest. So I really genuinely enjoyed being in a different experience. Um, and I went to the rehearsal on Thursday night and to practice this reading. And there was all sorts of things I had to remember to do. So when you go up to the, I'm really, I don't know what it's called. Is it an altar? So I've been in church my whole life, but I only know how one sort of set of rules work. So you had to go up and I had to, I had to remember to bow um, because before you go up and read the word, it, there's a sense of status. So you, you, you bow before you step across this threshold. And then I had to read it. Um, and then at the end... It was quite funny because at the end of my rehearsal, he said, and what do you say now? So I'm sort of thinking, do I just say the end? <laughs> do I, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. And um, so I said, do I, do I say thanks be to God? And he said, no, you say, this is the word of the Lord. And we say thanks be to God. I actually quite liked it. And what I quite liked about the whole service was that they, you have to respond partway through. If I said one thing, they had to say the other thing. I thought we could introduce a bit of that, couldn't we? So if I say, yay, you have to go, yo. And we could introduce a bit of that. But as I read this verse that I was very familiar with, he told me I talk too fast. I'm sorry, I do. Um, I noticed that I was reading it and, and he stopped me part way through. He said, you are going so fast. He said, you have to think about what you're saying. And my initial reaction, I wanted to go, I've been church my whole life. I'll have you know I am a Christian too. Because I thought, and then it occurred to me, I thought, I'm not actually thinking about what I'm reading. And because I had to practice and go slower so that I made the priest happy, um, so he wasn't angry with me. See, I do believe the myth. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I must have read this about five times. And by about the fifth time, I actually started listening to what I'm reading. I'm going to read you this. I want you to remember, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. I'm going to read you it, but I want you to genuinely do me a favor. I want you to pretend you've never heard it before. Because familiarity can mean that we don't hear it. So imagine you've never heard this before. Maybe some of you haven't, okay? Be ambitious... For the, I'm going to read it slow because I practice. Be ambitious for the higher gifts. And I am going to show you a way that is better than any of them. If I have the eloquence of men or of angels, but speak without love, I am simply a gong booming or a cymbal clashing. If I have the gift of prophecy, understanding all the mysteries there are and knowing everything, and I have faith in all its fullness, I can even have faith in all its fullness, to move mountains, so I can move mountains, I know that much about how this thing works, but without love, then I am nothing at all. If I give away all that I possess, piece by piece, and if I even let them take my body to burn it, so you're giving your all, but I'm without love, it will do me no good whatever. Love is always patient. It is never jealous. Love is never boastful or conceited. It is never rude or selfish. It does not take offense and it is not resentful. Love takes no pleasure in other people's sins but delights in the truth. It is always ready to excuse, to trust, to hope and to endure whatever comes. Love does not come to an end. Um, that is incredibly challenging incredibly challenging. And let me highlight just one specific way where I believe knowledge makes us really vulnerable. And we can, it's this really, we can be experts and our are such experts in our own history. 
including all our beliefs and everything else, but we know everything there is to know about ourselves and our history. And I mean, you said it before about how the only moment that exists is now. We struggle to live in that because we have intimate knowledge with everything that has ever happened to us, everything that has ever been said, everything that's ever gone well, everything that's ever not gone well. We know it inside out and back to front and we carry that knowledge and expertise into the next moment of our life and the next moment of our life. And that knowledge puffs us up and gives us that sense of self. And it's a real barrier to that agape love experience that builds in the moment. Um, we know, um, we rehearse it as well, don't we? We rehearse our history, the good, the bad, the ugly, constantly defining ourselves and who we are by it. And because it makes us feel a sense of self and of value. We can be an expert in our history and we can be such an expert in it that it can override our expertise in the exceedingly good, obscenely good, scandalously benevolent and powerfully life-changing changing grace driven by unconditional love. Now, I'm nearly there. We don't need that sort of massive grace if we have got it all sussed out, do we? If our knowledge has given us the right way to live, a sense of morals, an advanced and inner intellect when it comes to his word and how that word should be applied, we don't need a sense of grace because we're all just so we're all just sorted, aren't we? And going around with that inflated sense of, yes, I know things. Um, we can have knowledge of all those things and that's absolutely absolutely fine. Of course, we've got to learn stuff and grow in our understanding. But where this overrides our application of the love that builds, restores, repairs, where our fix fixation on what we know overrides applying loving wisdom in the now moment, that knowledge has got to have the air, whatever, put out of it and we've got to opt for the love that builds. Now I found the first bit really interesting last week um, and again you'll have to read it that myth of separation because we assume that he turns his face away because we're so bad. That's some of the stories been given. God had to look away because humanity was so awful and what it explains and read it for yourself is that actually Part of the problem that we believe was introduced, the main problem was that death was introduced. And so it was a life issue that we have to get resolved. Now, we all know that death is not just experienced when someone sadly breathes their last. You all know what it's like to feel dead inside, to feel, be in a situation that you feel is sucking the life out of you. Kids used to say all the time, oh, it's draining me. Do they still say that? I'm not in school anymore. It's draining me. You actually genuinely do know how it feels to be drained inside. And we all have those things that trigger in us. I sometimes think I have a little set of bullets that when something happens, it like triggers and go off. And that again is because I'm an expert in my own history. I know this has happened. So if something, I get a reaction here, oh, well, the same thing's just going to happen to me again. So off I go, and we're constantly reacting to those triggers. And our responses to the myths in our lives can lead the myths in our lives can lead to other things that drain the life. Now, three of these I've read about this week: boredom, cynicism, and despair. There's three cheery topics. Now, don't hear these as obvious negatives, because as I'm going to read to you now, they're actually more subtly dangerous than that. Because boredom, cynicism, and despair can actually be dressed up with Smiles and pretty ribbons. And I've read it, uh, I'm, I'm still reading this Rob Bell book. I'm about a third of the way through now. I'm not going very fast. But one of the things in, he writes about is these three things. I'm just going to read it to you momentarily. And I just need to give you the reference. He talks about, all the way through the book, the blinking line. And you know, if you ever type something up, you've got the cursor, and on the blank page, the line sort of just blinks and he makes a lot of references to sometimes it's like you're sitting in front of a computer screen, you've got a blinking line and it's flashing at you and you're just thinking, I don't know what I'm going to write. How interesting that you sang that song as well about your story's not written yet. It's like, what am I going to write here? So when it talks about the blinking line, that's what it means. But just listen to this because I thought it was really powerful. Boredom is lethal. Bored Boredom says there's nothing interesting to make here. 
Boredom reveals that we be- what we believe about the kind of world we're living in. Boredom is lethal because it reflects a static, fixed view of the world, a world that is finished. Cynicism is slightly different from boredom, but just as lethal. Cynicism says there's nothing new to make here. Often, cynicism presents itself as wisdom, but it usually comes from a wound. Cynicism acts as though it's seen a lot, knows how the world works, shooting down new ideas and efforts as childish and uninformed. Cynicism points out all the ways something could go wrong, wrong, how stupid it is, and what a waste of time it would be. Cynicism holds things at a distance, analysing and mocking and noting all the possibilities for failure. Often, this is because the cynic did try something new at some point and it went belly up, he was booed off the stage and that pain causes him to critique and ridicule because there aren't any risks in doing that. If you hold something at a distance and make fun of it, then it can't hurt you. And then there's despair. While boredom can be fairly subtle and cynicism can appear quite intelligent and even funny, despair is like a dull thud in the heart. Despair says nothing that we make matters. Despair reflects a pervasive dread that it's all pointless and that we are, in the end, simply wasting our time. Boredom, cynicism and despair are spiritual diseases because they disconnect us from the most primal truth about ourselves, that we are here. All three distance us from and deaden us to the question the blinking line asks us, how are you going to respond to this life you have been given? What are you going to do with it? And what are you going to make here? In summary then, there's nothing interesting to make here, there's nothing new to make here, nothing that we make matters. And I don't know if any of that resonates with you tonight, but I believe wholeheartedly that there is something interesting to make here. In each of your lives, in my life, in our lives of the community, Wherever we've got to and wherever our history has brought us to, there is something interesting to make here. There is also something new to make here. There's something wonderfully new to make here. And what we are making really, really matters because we're part of this great um, co-creatorship, if that's even a word. Things coming alive as we sow and live out our life. Now, I'm nearly there. Just slightly lost my place. I don't like that some of the knowledge I used to have has been deconstructed and I've had to unlearn it and learn new things. I don't like that because some of it made me feel substantial. But I love that we're very much at a point in this place where we're seeing that love build and we're in the process of very much constructing something new. And I think it would be lovely tonight if we could all be ambitious for the higher gift. How about if we became experts in here on that agape style of love? That we could somehow master that way of loving. That When we need to just ditch an idea we've always had in a moment for the sake of somebody being built, that we could just be flexible and fluid enough to say, do you know what? Yeah, I would have preferred it like that, but that's not what matters here. This is what matters here. This is what more, is more important. So this is my call to action tonight. There's four things. Firstly, um, I encourage you all to either listen again to last week or read it again and with a very specific point in mind. As you listen to it, as I've done this week, when you hit on ones that you think, oh, I can't quite get with that one, wrestle with it, sit there, look at it, wrestle with it, ask some questions about it and really weigh it up, not in the light of what makes you feel like it fits with your history, but in the light of what you believe will build and stretch and expand this peaceable kingdom. Um, The other thing that I really wanted to challenge you all to do is that wisdom being applied. Let's Start getting around in our lives people who have some wisdom. I have lots of people with wisdom in my life. There's people here, there's people in my family, and there's people at work who they just radiate some wisdom. And I was thinking today about what are the qualities of all of those people that I believe can't have bought and do bring 
wisdom to the knowledge and information in my life. Um, and these are the qualities, I thought. People who have wisdom are people that really listen. Because I read somewhere, there's a quote by someone, I can't remember who it was, but knowledge speaks, wisdom listens. And there's people are in your life who are great listeners. And often those people are people who are willing to then really genuinely hear and understand something and then speak out of that wise place. They cut through to the heart of the issue. And this to me is what a wise person does. They balance what they know the knowledge and information with an application of grace and love in a way that builds a faith worth having, in a way that reflects love and inclusion and hope. And they live in the tension and can live in a tension of having what the rules say should be done and what that word in the moment demands should be done now. Now, the reason I follow Anson and Chris is because, I, to me, they are wise people who are able to balance that tension. I, as I say, I can think of other people in my life. But let's get ourselves sometimes around wisdom. Sometimes we've got things going on and we get with people and it's all talk, 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 talk. And we never apply wisdom to the data. It just becomes about a knowledge that puffs up. So get around people like that. So you're going to listen to the myths, wrestle with those myths, get some wise counsel in your life. And fourthly, let's be willing, as was said last week, to in respond to that agape love and that grace on our life. Do you know that you don't know it all? Do you know that? You don't know it all. You are not an expert on everything, God, yourself, and others. So if you think you're written off and you're no good and there's no hope, that's that's not all there is to know about your life. And if you think someone else is written off and no good and there's no hope, that's not all there is to know about that person's life. And if we think we know it all, we don't. We know a small bit. And if we're willing to respond to the grace on our life, we can be pioneers who learn, who unlearn. And let's, if we're going to learn, learn how to be experts in love. Because it might not be an easy walk, but it's a very worthy walk. And it's a great walk that we can do together. So, did you get what I want you to do? <laughs> did you get your homework? Yeah. <laughs> so, listen, read them all online. Wrestle with the ones you're not sure about and ask questions. If you read something in those blogs and you think, I absolutely 100% disagree with that entirely, great, have a conversation. Just come and ask and say, I can't get with this one. You're going to have to explain it to me, go through. You're still going to be free to think what you want, but come and have the conversation. Um, get around some wise people and let's respond to the grace in our life and let's be people where love builds, love builds. Don't be obsessed with the rule book. Don't be expert on your own history. Let's build something now and good. So I pray for you to be wise and for you to all know that agape experience and let's be a group of people who build and be ambitious for that gift. So that's my response to Easter's Breaking Bad and I hope that has been helpful to you tonight. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you Wednesday. Yeah. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk then why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.